Thanks everybody for joining for the uh, Journal Club, which is part of Vinceri's Open Science Strategy. Um, it's my pleasure to be joined by Dr. Jennifer Mule, who is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Rutgers University. And um, she has had a lifelong interest in the etiology of schizophrenia, um, which has led her to mitochondria, our favorite organelle. Uh, she's going to be presenting uh, her recent manuscript uh, titled Cross-Species Analysis Identifies Mitochondrial Dysregulation as a Functional Consequence of the Schizophrenia-Associated 3Q29 Deletion, which, you know, of course, again, overlaps with our interests. With that, I will pass it over to Dr. Mule to tell us about her very interesting work. Awesome. And thank you so, so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Um, I am not a neuroscientist and I'm not a mitochondrial specialist. I'm trained as a geneticist. Um, and while I'm a very good geneticist, uh, I think you all know that there's a whole world of research that exists outside of that. Um, and our work, of course, has led us to the mitochondria, but it is particularly exciting for me to be here and talking to people who uh, know about the mitochondria. So I'd love to hear your um, thoughts and opinions about this work. Uh, before we get started, I would just like to give you a little bit of background because I think many people haven't heard of the 3K29 deletion. Um, and so let's just, that's okay. I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know right now. Um, so the 3K29 deletion or the, the idea that it was a syndrome was really first came to attention in 2005. So it hasn't been very long, less than 20 years that we've even known this as a syndrome. Um, in 2005, there was a case report and then a follow-on publication where six patients were described. Um, you know, geneticists love facial dysmorphology because it allows us to identify people in the clinic. But in 3K29 deletion syndrome, the facial dysmorphology is subtle and not particularly striking. Um, all of the individuals in this study had mild to moderate intellectual disability and language delay, um, which is probably why they came to clinical attention in the first place. Um, and, uh, and in this paper, it says that autism was a feature of the behavior of two of the patients, and a third patient has features of autism, but no diagnosis. So right away, we see that social disability, in addition to cognitive disability, is probably part of the phenotype. Uh, a few years after that, in two, two, 2008, 14 patients were described, um, and these were 14 patients out of 14,000 who had been referred for genetic testing because of idiopathic intellectual disability. Um, and when looking at the patients, mild to moderate intellectual disability was the only thing that was common to all those patients. They also had speech delay, um, some autism, like we saw in the first study, um, and then a few things that were present in one or two patients, and it's hard to know if they're really part of this of the syndrome. Um, and so the 3Q29 deletion really it seems has this profound negative impact on neurodevelopment and uncovering the biological consequences of this deletion will lead us into pathways that are relevant for, um, for some of these phenotypes. So I came to this field in 2010 um, as a postdoctoral fellow, I was looking for copy number variants that were associated with schizophrenia, and we could demonstrate that the 3 q 9 deletion, this thing that has previously been recognized as a pediatric syndrome, that it now seems to be associated with later onset phenotypes, um, in, in specifically schizophrenia. Um, so as a geneticist, I'm aware of this, you may or may not be, uh, the field of schizophrenia genetics is littered with broken hearts. There are, have been study after study that's been really promising uh, that um, has turned out to the results haven't panned out on reanalysis or they haven't been replicated. And we were very mindful of this. So we did the best and most rigorous study that we could. And then we very carefully published it. And we were very excited when independent groups also demonstrated that the 3 q 9 deletion was enriched among individuals with schizophrenia. A few years after that, there was enough data in the public domain that I could do a sort of larger study with more people. And that meta-analysis revealed that the 3Q29 deletion confers, not only is it associated with his schizophrenia, but it confers a 40-fold increase in risk for schizophrenia, which is astonishingly high. And then in a definitive study by the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, led in a heroic effort by Christian Marshall, um, 41,000 subjects were identified, about half of those had schizophrenia, half of those were controls. Um, the data were reanalyzed through a common pipeline. This was a monster amount of work, specifically looking for copy number variants associated with schizophrenia. And after all that work, only eight loci had genome-wide significance, the 3Q29 deletion among them. And so we now regard the 3Q29 deletion as really an established schizophrenia risk locus. And again, given the sort of controversies and trials and tribulations of schizophrenia genetics research, being in the position that we're in where we have genetic loci associated with schizophrenia um, is particularly exciting. This is kind of a, we're at sort of a, a watershed moment in schizophrenia genetics. 
Um, and so this is the sort of the latest and greatest, the most up-to-date um, sort of genetic findings in schizophrenia. Um, so on the x-axis is the population frequency and on the y-axis is the effect size or the degree of risk associated with schizophrenia. Out here in blue are common variants associated with schizophrenia. You can see that these are um, quite common in the general population, anywhere from 5% to 50% frequency. Um, but you can also see that they don't confer very much risk. They raise your risk for schizophrenia 5% at 10% at most. Um, and then as variants get correspondingly more rare, the risk increases. And we study the 3Q29 deletion. So we live here in the penthouse. The 3Q29 deletion has the highest effect size for schizophrenia of any variant yet identified. And this really gives us a jumping off point for, for functional studies. If we understand what the 3Q29 deletion does, it may give us clues about the underlying biology of schizophrenia. So this is the 3 q 9 deletion. Um, so up here is a schematic of human chromosome 3, and we're way out here near the telomere on the long arm. Uh, and if we blow this interval up, um, this really is the size of the typical deletion. It's about 1.6 megabases or 1,600,000 base pairs. Um, and there are 21 genes in this interval. Uh, so everybody that you know, almost everybody that you know is born with two copies of this interval, uh, but about one in 30,000 times, somebody is born with just one copy of this interval and that leads to 3Q29 deletion syndrome. And these 21 genes, right, are like a tremendous clue. There is something about having one, only one copy of one or more of these genes that renders somebody uniquely susceptible to developing schizophrenia. Um, and so these genes, right, I think about them when I wake up in the morning, I think about them when I go to bed at night, I dream about them. Um, these are really like all of the magic is right here. And it's up to us to understand what losing a copy of one or more of these genes is doing. So that's really a focus, a tremendous focus of my lab. Um, so a few years ago, we got NIH funding to do uh, sort of a deep phenotyping study where we brought individuals into my university uh, and we conducted, they were with us for two days and we just phenotype, phenotype, phenotype with gold standard instruments the whole time. Um, and what we learned is that uh, individuals with 3 q 9 deletion syndrome, about 30, a little over 30% qualify for a diagnosis of intellectual disability. We did confirm that intellectual disability is mild. The average IQ in this population is about 73. Um, and they actually have um, uh, some impact to verbal ability, but actually verbal ability is a strength and it's really nonverbal reasoning uh, that has a bigger hit. Uh, so lots of interesting nuances there. 20% uh, of the study subjects we evaluated had a frank diagnosis of schizophrenia, and another 15% have, have an evidence of schizophrenia prodrome. Uh, about nearly 40% of our study subjects qualified for a diagnosis of, eight, of autism spectrum disorders. We saw an awful lot of anxiety disorders, again, about 40%. Um, our individuals, a little over 40%, had clinically significant executive function deficits, um, and something we were unaware of, about two-thirds of our study subjects qualified for a diagnosis of ADHD, and that ADHD is typically inattentive type rather than hyperactive type. Um, and then finally, uh, nearly three-fourths of our study subjects had clinically significant visual motor integration deficits. Um, and so again, widespread neurodevelopmental impact of the 3Q29 deletion, which is somewhat mild, milder than other syndromes. You know, the average IQ in Fragile X syndrome is like 40, um, but the IQ in 3Q29 deletion syndrome is about 73. So, so a mild impact, but um, the sort of in combination uh, you know, having, especially many of our study subjects have more than one diagnosis. So we have people who have autism and ADHD and anxiety disorders, and obviously that can lead to sort of some um, problematic outcomes. So uh, we think this is really valuable information to put out there uh, because it helps develop and formulate effective management strategies for individuals with 3Q29 deletion syndrome, in addition to giving us clues about the neurodevelopmental impact. So the other thing we were able to do is we were able to put our study subjects in a neuroimager um, and we were astonished. I'm not a neuroimaging expert. Luckily, I have um, really great collaborators, um, but, but you don't need to be a neuroimaging expert to see. So here's a typically developing a representative healthy control. And you can see that that cerebellum is nice and robust. It fills out that, that, that cavity. Um, and yet our individuals with 3Q29 deletion syndrome have cerebella that really look quite different than that. Um, and so this is just another clue about the syndrome that there may be an impact to the cerebellum. Um, one other thing I want to tell you before we get started about the paper is that uh, 
we were able to create a mouse model of the 3K29 deletion. And so this is a schematic of human chromosome three. Um, it's syntenic to mouse chromosome 16. The only thing is that there's one extra gene in mouse called BEX6, which is not present in human, uh, but every human that is present in mouse, in human is present in mouse. Um, and using CRISPR, we've been able to excise this exact region um, and we could show that the 3 k 9 deletion mouse has some deficits in learning and memory and other things which indicate that there's a neurodevelopmental impact. Um, okay, so I've mentioned now multiple times, we've confirmed that the 3 k 9 deletion is indeed has this tremendous impact to neurodevelopmental phenotypes, um, including schizophrenia. Um, and I've talked a number of times about how if understanding the molecular impact of the 3 k 9 deletion will lead us to schizophrenia, but how are we gonna do that? Well, we have two key reagents, right? We have the 3 k 9 deletion mouse model, which is fabulous, right? I told you it has syntony with the human interval that it recapitulates many of the human phenotypes. Physiology is faithful and complex, right? That brain grows up in a brain case and it goes through birth and all of the things, and that's great. The problem is that it's it's not human. And what, if we think that schizophrenia is a uniquely human phenotype, it gets hard to rely on this mouse model. We also, in our phenotyping study, we were able to get samples from our study subjects and create human cellular models. And we all know about the power of iPSCs. They're great, they're amazing. Um, we have these participants with deep phenotyping data, but of course, even if we create brain organoids, it's only partially complex, partially faithful to complex brain physiology. So both of these systems are useful, but neither one is perfect. And our question is, could we use both of these to arrive at high value 3 k 9 targets? And so if we were to do say transcriptional pro profiling like RNAC, um, we would have a, a number of, um, of targets that were differentially expressed in mouse and differentially expressed in human organoids. And could we ask about that overlap? So things that were differentially expressed in both mouse and human, would we regard those as sort of real, true positives? Um, with the highest confidence targets. Um, and I wanna say that I'm proud of many things that my lab has done, um, but getting this animation to work is one of the things that I'm proudest of. So, um, right. Okay, so um, so in addition to using these two, these two systems, um, we're gonna use a single cell sequencing strategy and we're gonna vary our developmental time points. Um, and the results were published, as you know, recently in Science Advances um, and the title gives away the punchline that we find mitochondrial dysregulation as a problem. Uh, so what did we do? Okay, so uh, so we had human cortical organoids and we let them grow for either two months and harvested them or we let them grow for 12 months and harvested them. So we were really kind of spanning a wide developmental range. Um, we also took mouse isocortex from postnatal day seven. We had four control animals and four 3K29 deletion animals. I just told you that there is a big cerebellar impact to 3K2, in the 3K29 deletion. So why here are we using cortical organoids and mouse cortex? Well, at the time that we launched this experiment, we didn't know about the cerebellar impact in 3K29 deletion syndrome. And so an active interest of our lab is to repeat this whole experiment now in cerebellum rather than cortex. Um, so we did single cell RNA-seq. Um, this is sort of a schematic. We look for the overlap and then we do pathway analysis. And we're going to talk about all of these things. Uh, I already showed you the human and mouse intervals. This is just a reminder that they are syntenic. Um, so we did our single cell RNA-seq. We did clustering. We get these beautiful, beautiful cluster diagrams, which I love looking at. Um, but when we colored them, so down here in panel D, in the green and blue, we colored them by control in 3K29 deletion. And you can see that in every cluster that we have, there's equal representation from the control cells and from the 3K29 cells. Um, but when we colored them by time point, you can see that most of the clusters are comprised either of two month or 12 month cells. And we were initially a little bit concerned about this, but when we started looking at the identity of these cell types, it turns out that all of the two month cell types are um, sort of progenitor cells uh, or, or sort of cells that are developing. They're not much, they're really like immature cell types. And in the 12 month clusters, we have mature cell types. Um, and so that was something that was really exciting to us because it suggested that we really had sampled a wide span of development of cells in various stages of development. Um, and then just here's our mouse cortex. Um, and you can see again, just like in the human cortical organoids in mouse cortex, um, we have um, an equal representation in each cluster of control in 3K29 cells. Um, and we did a little bit of correlation with the brain span data set just to ask um, how old are our, you know, like what does this correlate best with? Um, and sure enough, early time points correlate with sort of um, 
the 50, 50 day old organoids correlate with early time points. And the later we sample, the later, the more correlation there is with later time points. So that's good. Um, one question that people ask me a lot is they say, oh, you know, when you're thinking about the 3Q29 deletion, can't you just look at where the genes are expressed and doesn't that give you clues, you know, about either what cell type or doesn't give you clues about what genes might be important. Um, and so this is a supplemental figure, but um, on the X axis, we have all of the genes in the 3Q29 interval up here as human and down and, and um, the lower panel they're in red is mouse. Um, on the Y axis, we have the different clusters. And this is just to make the point that in every cluster, there's a 3Q29 deletion um, gene that is expressed. So we can't really rule out any clusters. Um, and that in the majority of the clusters, at least one 3Q29 interval gene is expressed. So we also can't really rule out any genes. This is a great idea, but it doesn't really let us rule out or rule in anything. We could prioritize things, but we can't really cut anything off of our list and say that's not important. Uh, the other thing that's really cool is um, this is another supplemental figure. So we just asked um, on the x-axis here, we have in a given cluster, the number of 3Q29 interval genes that are, that are differentially expressed. And on the y-axis, we have the number of other genes that are differentially expressed. Um, and it does seem like the more 3Q29 interval genes that are dysregulated, the more other targets are dysregulated. So we think every time you dysregulate a 3Q29 interval gene, you dysregulate some number of genes. And it's something like 60 to 100 additional genes are dysregulated with each 3Q29 interval gene that's dysregulated. Though that relationship isn't quite linear. Okay, so in figure two, now uh, we identified um, in human uh, cortical organoids for each cluster, we identified differentially regulated genes and we did the same thing in mouse. Um, and then we took those genes and we said, well, what pathways pop up? Um, and you can see that, and so these are um, in panel B are upregulated genes in the human and in panel C are downregulated genes in the human. Um, and we see genes related to oxidative phosphorylation dysregulated in both of those. And it turns out that the upregulated genes for oxidative ph phosphorylation really come from those two month organoids and the downregulated genes for oxidative phosphorylation are really being contributed by the 12 month um, organoids. Um, and some of the genes that are driving those include, um, we looked at some sort of key mitochondrial regulation genes. Um, and these are just violin plots showing uh, uh, the expression of those genes in 3K29 compared to control. Um, and then in mouse isocortex, um, we found uh, um, not so much in upregulated genes, but in downregulated genes, uh, we found mitochondrial um, aerobic respiration, uh, ATP metabolic process, and mitochondrial respiratory chain assembly all were downregulated. And because this time point in mouse isocortex, which is day P7, is most tightly related to the 12 month organite organized time point, these are actually quite consistent with one another. Um, so oxidative phosphorylation or mitochondrial genes being downregulated at later time points is a theme. Um, okay, so very exciting. Um, but now, um, is this meaningful? Well, let's look at overlap. Um, and so we took the two clusters that had the most genes dysregulated. We took astrocytes and we took the excitatory neurons. And then we asked what's dysregulated in mouse, what's dysregulated in human, and what is the overlap between those? And to further increase our um, sort of rigor, we also asked that these be changed in the same direction. So these are genes that are decreased. These are genes that are increased in astrocytes and in neurons. Um, and in every case, that overlap um, or almost every case, the overlap is quite significant. So, um, but it's really quite significant in neurons. So in excitatory neurons, we have 150, 15 genes that overlap between mouse and human. And that's an astonishingly high p-value. It's two times more than we would expect if this were just random chance. Um, and same thing in the, in the genes that are increased. Um, and in each case, even though the information from astrocytes wasn't quite as robust, um, we still see electron transport chain, mitochondrial ATP synthesis, and so on. Um, and we also see that in excitatory neurons. Um, and so all roads seem to be leading us to mitochondrial dysregulation, at least from, an, from a transcriptional profiling perspective. But, you know, where the rubber meets the road is function, right? Is this meaningful? Um, and so the first thing that we did was um, we just looked at proteins and we asked, well, RNAs changed, but our proteins changed. Um, so we used an antibody cocktail, which has an antibody to each of the different um, respiratory chain complexes, one, two, yeah. three, four, five. 
Um, and sure enough, we see that there's kind of a change stoichiometry of the electron transport chain co complexes in mouse. Um, so then, and I should mention that this work was done by an incredibly talented postdoctoral fellow in the lab named Dr. Ryan Purcell. So the next thing that Ryan did was he said, okay, it's time to really assess um, mitochondrial function. And he did this using the seahorse assay, which many people are familiar with. Um, and so, um, and he took cells and he um, incubated them in either glucose or galactose. And of course, when you incubate cells in galactose, um, in glucose, they tend to use glycolysis, glycolysis for energy. And in, when you incubate them in galactose, they tend to use oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and you can see that there's really some big differences between the 3Q29, 3Q29s here and control, which is here. And really it has to do with this sort of baseline um, oxygen consumption rate in glucose media. Um, and that's expressed here. Um, here's the the um, mean baseline oxygen consumption rate in control cells and in 3Q29 cells. And so what these data suggest is that even at baseline in glucose, when glucose is plentiful and a cell might use glycolysis for energy consumption, 3Q29 cells are actually leaning on oxidative phosphorylation. Um, uh, and that also translates into something important, which is demonstrated over here, that there's really no spare capacity in 3 e 9 cells. So if mitochondria wanted to bump up their ATP production, they might ramp up, um, they might turn to oxidative phosphorylation to ramp up that ATP production. But 3 q 9 cell uh, mitochondria may be operating already kind of at, the, at, at maximum capacity, um, and they don't have any spare capacity. So bumping up um, may not be possible. So there's sort of kind of a lack of metabolic flexibility. Um, so those prior experiments in figure four um, were done in, I want to say they were done in HEK293 cells. Um, so Dr. Purcell had taken HEK293 cells and had excised the 3Q29 interval. Um, and that was really great, but we also wanted to see that done in our human cells. Um, uh, and this is kind of the same assay showing again that there's this sort of um, uh, this lack of metabolic flexibility that also exists in neural progenitor cells. Um, so, um, so in conclusion, sorry, I don't have a conclusion slide. How is that possible? Um, so in conclusion, um, um, what we've demonstrated so far is that there's a change in the way that mitochondria function in 3Q29 cells. Our next job is to connect that to, um, you know, whether that's especially meaningful in the cerebellum because we have the cerebellar phenotype. Um, we also wanna see if we can make things better or worse. Um, and if we improve mitochondrial function or if we make it worse, does that have an impact on behavior? And we're really grateful that we have our mouse model for that. Um, so, but this is exciting because it's the first kind of cellular impact that we've seen about the 3Q29 deletion. Uh, and so, you know, our job is to now to figure out what it means. So um, thank you so much for listening. And I'd be delighted to hear your thoughts. I Wonderful. That. Thank you for the uh, the lovely talk. And I love hearing from geneticists because I think, you know, in the field of Parkinson's, at, at least uh, the genetics has been very fruitful in giving us kind of cause and effect relationships. I'm sure in the field of schizophrenia, it's the same thing. So thanks for doing that. And, you know, we sure. always follow the works of geneticists. <laughs> you guys tell us where to look. <laughs> well, and what's interesting, I think, is you're exactly right. For so many disorders out there, um, like I think a lot about cancer biology because we've had genetic findings in cancer for a very long time. And I feel like that has really opened the door to helping us understand idiopathic cancer. And I feel like, and Parkinson's disease is another great example. Alzheimer's disease is a great example. There have been genetic findings for many conditions. Metabolism, right? We've known about metabolic disorders for a long time. Um, but understanding um, schizophrenia, I think part of the reason why we're so behind is because we haven't really had good genetic findings until, you know, the last few years. So I, I'm hopeful about the future. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I am uh, interested at one thing, and, and somebody else pointed this out as well, it's really nice that you, um, uh, that you showed both mouse and human. I think that that is a really nice kind of cross comparison and also to see if the models that you're, you know, people can use will have relevance to the human indication. Um, so two questions on that, I'll ask mine and then I'll ask the other one as well. Um, my question was, you know, what kind of variability do you see? It, it's kind of hard to tell, especially in kind of like the, the heat map 
uh, plots and, and these types of plots, what kind of variability you see between um, the organoid samples, because one of the things that I've, and we don't do organoid work ourselves yet at this point, but one thing that I keep hearing is that there's so much variability from sample to sample and it's kind of hard to decipher. Um, and then the other question that was kind of related to this as well was, have you used patient samples uh, to kind of further triangulate this? And I wonder if you get even more variability if you look at patients. Right, right, exactly. And um, so you have hit on exactly why we sought to use um, this strategy where we tried, where we asked about overlap. Um, because, you know, going after something functionally, like doing RNA seq is like, standard, right? And you always find something and it's always good. But when you start doing functional assays, it's a huge investment to optimize the assay to, um, you know, to collect the data, um, especially when you do it in IPSCs, right? It takes a couple of weeks just to get to the point where you can actually do the work. And so that variability is exactly why we chose this strategy. We thought if we started chasing stuff that's in, that's in this whole space, we're not going to know if it's real. And if our assays don't work, we're not going to be quite as motivated. And so that's why we thought, well, let's start with the stuff that overlaps because, you know, two different systems, two different, um, like, you know, totally different batches, totally different sort of ways that the cells are developing. And if we see things that are changed in both, it really gives us confidence this is, is actually something that's changed. So that's the variability is exactly why we chose this strategy. Makes sense. Um, and uh, another question um, is, as schizophrenia is progressive, are there any plans to do longitudinal studies beyond the 12 months? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think I wanna to return to your question about, um, I don't think I answered the question about patient samples. So um, so there's some work in, there's another syndrome um, that I that is actually very similar to 3Q29 uh, called 22Q deletion syndrome. And 22Q deletion, so, Here's the 3Q29 deletion and risk for schizophrenia. And here's the 22Q deletion. So it's right behind the 3Q29 deletion, huge risk for schizophrenia. And it turns out that the 22Q deletion may have some mitochondrial dysregulation as well. Um, and then in investigators in that study uh, actually had people with 22Q deletion who had schizophrenia and individuals with the 22Q deletion who didn't have schizophrenia. And it turns out that the 22Q people who didn't have schizophrenia were able to compensate. They were able to upregulate some genes and kind of like homeostatically readjust mitochondrial function. And the people who had schizophrenia were unable to do so. So the, the, the mitochondrial deficit was really most prevalent in those individuals that had schizophrenia. And we wonder, you know, I mean, the next exciting part is we have people with 3Q29 deletion syndrome who have a wide range of abilities. We have people who have an IQ of 40 and we have people who have an IQ of 99. So really a wide range. And I wonder if um, our next question is to ask, uh, is the degree of mitochondrial dysregulation somehow related to phenotype, right? People have worse phenotypes, worse mm -hmm. outcomes. Mm -hmm. Do they have worse mitochondrial function? So I said all that about patient samples. So we are very interested in using patient samples. And now I think I've lost the thread of the question that you just asked, which was. <laughs> uh, actually, you, thank you for answering that question because that was also a question I had. I think, uh, thanks for pointing that out because a lot of times people don't in these not fully penetrant kind of you know risk factors. They're not kind of you know fully penetrant, right? So the question of what about the people who have it but don't get the disease is a really important one that can be informative as well. So thanks for answering that one. Um, the question uh, from the, the group was from Anahit was, uh, are there plans to look at longitudinal studies beyond the 12 months? Ah, yes. And in fact, we would like to do, um, I also think that 50 days isn't even like young enough because at 50 days, there's already tons of like the cat may be out of the bag by then, right? We saw thousands of genes that were just regulated. And so what we would really like to do is a study where we do really dense sampling, right? Where we harvest organoids at like you know, a week and then, you know, maybe two weeks, like maybe we harvest every week or something um, that may be informed. We have to do, there's some data in databases and we have to do a more detailed analysis of the, the actual longitudinal expression of the genes themselves. And that may inform our choice of data points, but yes, absolutely. We would love to see like, what is the earliest emergence of dysregulation um, and then what happens over time. So we're very interested in that. Um, and based on what you're seeing so far, just to follow up on that, you know, how much of it do you think is how, how important is that developmental phase um, where where you are seeing kind of this shift uh, 
as opposed to, and I'm getting to it from a translational perspective, right. would treating this in adulthood be sufficient or do you really need to be correcting this really early on? You know, we don't know. And that's kind of a debate right now in the field of schizophrenia itself. Um, because we treat schizophrenia when it emerges, right? But there are some people who think that by the time those sort of most severe symptoms of hallucinations and delusions emerge, that that's actually, you know, the late stage, that that's a culmination of a long process of neurodevelopmental regulation. Um, and would you be better off intervening early? Um, and there's actually like a ton of push toward that right now in the field. Um, one thing that we would love to do um, one of the next things that we think is important is figuring out which genes are driving the 3 k 9 phenotype, because then we would love to, um, like, you know, flocks them and then turn them on or off, um, as need, right. And ask like how, you know, like, so if you get past, say, you know, if you're postnatal and then you delete these genes, do you still see a phenotype, right? right. If, so, so I think there's lots of really exciting kind of what is the developmental trajectory? When are things reversible? When is the go, no go point? I think those are excellent questions. Yeah. And, and you sort of are reading my mind as to the next question. <laughs> that was my next question. <laughs> you know, um, uh, how, would you be able to turn the genes? Well, you can, of course, but what are the plans for turning the genes off and on? Um, yeah. So and we would... And you know, the unfortunate thing is because the region itself is so big, if we were to creep, we can't like, we can't do the whole thing, right? It'll happen at variable numbers. It won't be effective. But if we knew which genes were driving the phenotype, it would be a little bit of work and effort, but we could make a, a you know, we could do like a triple knockout, for example, um, and then ask, uh, and then do play games, right? Where, and we could even do a combinatoric where we turn off one, but not that, you know, when we turn off two, when we ask. So there's lots of really exciting things to do um, in that developmental space. Yeah, that's really interesting. And maybe that's a good segue into moving to PAC2, which is one of the, the genes that yep. you've identified. Um, a couple of questions in the chat, and there's, you know, one, one that I have as well, which um, maybe I'll ask the chat ones first. Uh, do PAC2 haploinsufficient mice phenocopy any aspect of schizophrenia? Um, they do They do not. There is a group that has knocked out PAC2 and has shown that there's some autism-like behaviors and some mild connectivity issues in the mouse. Um, as far as I know, there is not an association between PAC2 and schizophrenia or PAC2 and autism <laughs> in humans. So genetically, that doesn't pan out. Although it may, who knows when sample sizes get larger. And then finally, Dr. Purcell, who created the HEK mutants, um, also created a PAC2 knockout. Um, and it had a very mild mitochondrial mm -hmm. phenotype, very mild, but was not um, did not completely recapitulate the magnitude of the impact. Um, and okay, that's, gotcha. Yeah. So it's probably not just PAC2 then. It's, it's exactly a combination and, at least. Exactly. And the other gene in the interval that lots of people are interested in is DLG1. And we have, we previously made a DLG1 knockout mouse, uh, heterozygous knockout, just a half Um, And that mouse also, we haven't tested it mitochondrially, but we have tested it behaviorally. And that those mice had very mild, tiny, 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 mild. But so pack, so DLG1 by itself is also not responsible for the phenotypes that we see. So it really may be a combination of several of these genes. Exactly. Yeah. And so that probably answers another question I had, which was, you know, do you think inhibiting PAC2 in adulthood would have deleterious effects? Because it is something that's being considered um, for some cancers. So, but sounds like probably not since it's not the only one. And if you have cancer, you have kind of bigger things to worry about. <laughs> right, exactly. And my understanding is, because there's also a, there's also a cancer locus that's in the 3 q 9 interval, a cancer susceptibility locus. Um, but my guess is that... Um, I don't know this for sure, but my guess is that, so the 3 q 9 deletion is an underexpression of PAC2. My guess is that um, cancer phenotypes might be from an overexpression of PAC2. I don't know that for sure. Um, but, so you may just be correcting that rather than- Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. right got it. Um, and then one last question on PAC2, which is, you know, one other way rather than knocking out PAC2 might be to kind of replace PAC2 in the, the full deletion. Have you thought about doing that? Yeah, 100%. Exactly. We think about overexpressing the, 
Um, and in fact, that's part of our excitement about getting to driver genes, right? Is if there really were three simultaneous things that needed to be knocked out, you could replace just one, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you need really all three. So that's a really exciting avenue for intervention that we think a lot about. Yeah, lots of, uh, anytime there's something like this, lots of ideas of what to do next, right? <laughs> no exactly. short term ideas. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and you sort of answered this question with the DLG1, uh, but Jody had asked, in addition to PAC2, have you identified additional driver genes that contribute to the metabolic phenotype in your models? Uh, we haven't. We have a lot of hypotheses, but we haven't identified anything yet. And one thing that's interesting to us about the mitochondrial phenotype is that if we look at the function, the known function of genes in the 3Q29 interval, there isn't anything that is a solidly mitochondrial gene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, so, so it's like, there's a, there's kind of an interesting in between step, right? 3Q29 interval genes must be interacting with something you know, so this is almost like a tertiary effect. Uh, and so there, again, like a lot of work to do, a lot of understanding to figure that out. Yeah. And there was actually a question very much related to what you just said, which is, are the, are there genes outside the directly deleted region, which might be affected by the deletion, um, possible broader scope for functional evaluation, which, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we've done some work with Elise Robinson from the Broad. Um, and Elise has done kind of these really beautiful kind of um, she's taken in 22Q and 16P and now 3Q29, she's taken the interval and then a substantial amount of, of region, a substantial region outside that interval. And she's asked about gene expression. And it turns out in 22Q, there are long range effects. So when you have that deletion and then you look outside the interval, there's kind of a global um, change in, in gene expression across this entire, a much larger interval than just the deletion. The same thing is true with 16P. It doesn't seem to be true for 3Q29. It seems <laughs> that 3Q29 really the impact is internal um, to the, the genes that are within the interval. Interesting. And and the genetically encoded portions, is there I think there are some non-genetically, some regions that are not encoding for genes in there as well. Is that true? Um, so there are some, uh, there's, um, there's a putative microRNA that we haven't chased down. There are three long non-coding RNAs. <laughs> of the three long non-coding RNAs, um, two are definitely not expressed in brain. One is allegedly expressed in brain, but we couldn't find any evidence of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so probably most likely the genes then. It, so yeah, that's, that's our, good that's our yeah, working hypothesis right now is that it really is the protein coding units within the interval. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, another question from um, Rick Margolin, which says schizophrenia has uh, well-characterized or well-recognized clinical subtypes and also overlaps in some ways with other uh, psychotic disorders, such as bipolar disorder. Is this similar in the 3Q29 deletion syndrome? Um, so I'm going to answer that in a slightly different way. The question we usually get is, does 3Q29 schizophrenia look like typical schizophrenia? And the answer is yes. So far, we haven't been able to distinguish 3Q29 schizophrenia from, you know, the garden variety schizophrenia that might be diagnosed in any psychiatrist's office. Um, they have the same kind of... Um, Delusions, delusions, which are really kind of bizarre and sometimes grandiose um, and hallucinations, which can often be auditory in nature. Like the profile is really similar. We don't see anything that distinguishes this kind of schizophrenia from typical schizophrenia. Interesting. Um, and do you have any thoughts on what might be kind of driving these patients towards schizophrenia, given that mitochondrial function is important for so many different things? And I know this is a magical, you know, million dollar question, but... Any thoughts? Yeah. yeah, we, you know, we don't, but connecting mitochondrial dysfunction to presumably neuronal function, right? Um, and then to behavior uh, is kind of our holy grail right now. Um, and as I mentioned, one of the things that we found is that, that cerebellar changes, right? The cerebellum is smaller in individuals with 3K29 deletion. Um, and uh, it has been, there is conjecture in the literature that the cerebellum is one of the most energetically demanding parts of the brain and that within the cerebellum, Purkinje cells in particular are quite energetically demanding. And so we wonder if there's an interaction there. Like we wonder if, um, you know, I mean, this is a working hypothesis that is based in only, it is like, you know, complete fantasy. We have no data for it, but you can imagine a model where you have compromised mitochondrial function and then Purkinje cells are uniquely 
susceptible to this change in mitochondrial function. And whether that's, you know, it could be cytoskeletal, right? It could be as you're building networks, you can't quite, um, you don't have a, a continuous ATP supply. And so, you know, it just, just, it could be just slight, right? Um, but your Purkinje cells make inappropriate connections and now your circuitry or your wiring is not right. And then ultimately that leads to schizophrenia and perhaps even autism and intellectual disability. So, but whether that's true or not is going to require so much work. <laughs> right, right. Much, much more work to be done. That's always right. a good thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're all be, we'll all be in business for a while, but, <laughs> you know, but you, and you, you know, you're asking exactly the right question because then it gives us a, right. Like there's a, okay, here's a place where we can intervene, right. We mm -hmm. need to make those Purkinje cells, whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I was actually a little surprised by the effect on the, the cerebellum. I had not really seen that associated. I'm not a schizophrenia person, but I hadn't really seen that associated much with schizophrenia. I also wonder, you know, we, I guess I tend to think of cerebellum more for like balance and things like that. Do you see any alterations in balance in these patients or? Yeah. No? So it, it's interesting that you asked that because when we saw the minute that we saw that the cerebellum was compromised in our kids, we recruited a pediatric neurologist to our study and the pediatric neurologist did do like gait abnormality, you know, she checked gait and fine motor, and you know, close your eye and touch your finger to your nose and stuff like that. Um, and our kids have some very minor fine motor deficits, but there's no, you know, almost no ataxia or gait abnormalities or any kind of gross motor phenotypes. Um, and, and it's funny that you say that because that is everybody thinks about motor control, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's some data to suggest, and one of the proponents of this hypothesis is Dr. J.D. Schmalman, who's at Harvard. Um, and he's probably the most vociferous, although there definitely are people out there who who suspect or have provided data that, that, that this, just like the cerebellum exerts this sort of control over motor phenotypes, it exerts a similar control over executive function phenotypes and probably even social behaviors. And in fact, there's a really influential um, synthetic review written by Sam Wong from Princeton, uh, which reviews all of the evidence. And he really thinks that the cerebellum is gonna turn out to be fundamental in autism and autism related behaviors. Um, and then, uh, and then like back in 1996, Dr. Nandi Andreessen um, had data to suggest that the cerebellum is changed in individuals with schizophrenia among those who are not. I've asked around a lot about this question, like, do we think the cerebellum is involved in schizophrenia? Um, and a colleague of mine said, you know, um, for many years, the dopamine hypothesis reigned supreme about schizophrenia. And it turns out that in the cerebellum, there is very little dopamine. And so early on, people kind of said, like disregarded the cerebellum as possibly even being involved in schizophrenia. And it's only recently that it's emerged as a potential site of interest. Recently, the Enigma Consortium or a precursor to the Enigma Consortium has found that there are changes in the cerebellum among a large sample of individuals with schizophrenia. So I think, again, in the next decade, I think we're going to see a ton of stuff about the cerebellum. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I think those dogmas come back to haunt us. You know, exactly. Anytime, anytime exactly. we say this is, you know, this, this is not involved. Thing, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> a guarantee it's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Maybe that one region is involved, but it's probably not the only region that's involved. Um, I do want to ask, since we, we were talking about dopamine, <laughs> um, have you looked at other dopaminergic systems within the brain, you know, whether it's the the kind of reward pathway or even the um, uh, you know, Nigra, Nigra or VTA, any of those areas at all? Yeah. So there's actually a really talented graduate student, um, who's, uh, her name is Sindhu and she's working in my collaborators lab, Miriam Brokarsley, and they are looking at dopamine in, in various parts of the brain. Um, and she actually does see changes, um, and those changes are reversed with, um, antipsychotic treatment. Oh, so okay. who knows, right? Like, yeah. So one of the things, and I think, you know, we tend to separate these uh, very much neurodegeneration and um, uh, um, neuropsychiatric diseases, but uh, psychosis is actually a symptom, a common symptom in neurodegenerative disease. And I think it's yeah. not talked about very much. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. As is, yeah. As is cognitive decline. Right. And so, you know, cognitive decline often precedes hallucinations in schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's interesting that that also happens in neurodegeneration just at a much later time point. Um, yeah, that's a really, I, I hadn't put those together, but you're exactly right. I wonder if there's uh, something there. 
Yeah, it would be interesting to note. I, I know there was a paper that came out not that long ago that showed that people with schizophrenia were actually at a higher risk for Parkinson's disease, but I don't know if anybody replicated those results or not. It was a large, large study. Um, so yeah, it would be, would be interesting to learn more about that as well. Um, on that too, uh, I guess, what do you see from a translational perspective? And there's another question that kind of relates to that as well, but I'm kind of curious to leave that as an open-ended question first. Yeah. So I think um, right now we, uh, it, in fact, I was just at a conference and there was a lot of debate about this. Um, we think of people with schizophrenia, we put them in a bin and we say they have schizophrenia and we think they're all the same, right? And we treat them with the same medications. Um, it, and, it, you know, the, the the question that came up a lot in in this meeting was, is is psychosis really a thing unto itself or is it like fever, right? Is it a signal of something, but the cause of that is so multifactorial, right? Um, and so part of what we want to understand with the 3 t 9 deletion, we want to understand the pathway, right? We want to understand how people get schizophrenia. And once we understand the mechanism, we want to ask, well, how common is this mechanism for causing schizophrenia? Is there convergence with other people? And it would be great if we found like some kind of biomarker so that, that we could then go into a panel of people with schizophrenia who don't have genetic causes and ask, do they have schizophrenia for the same underlying reason or biology? And I think that question is really important because if schizophrenia is not one thing, but if it's a thousand different things, right? Like really the thought of personalized, like the way that we currently treat schizophrenia, the way we even do clinical trials, we're never going to be successful. And we're really going to have to start taking into account what your schizophrenia is due to mitochondrial dysregulation or excess mm -hmm. dopamine signaling or, you know, infection or whatever. So I think that's actually one of the central questions that um, that we need to figure out is, is schizophrenia one thing or is it a thousand things? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And uh, one that we also think about on the neurodegeneration mm -hmm. side, because we also see a lot of heterogeneity and it's interesting. Uh, it, it's really nice to have these kind of cross-disciplinary conversations just to see where we are overlapped. And, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, finding biomarkers for mitochondrial deficits, and that may sounds like it may go beyond relevance for Parkinson's disease, but may actually have relevance for other indications as well. And even within mitochondria, you know, we tend to just say mitochondrial dysfunction, but it's so different, you know, are you deficient in oxfos? Are you deficient in, you know, mitophagy? Are you deficient in uh, other quality control mechanisms? Lipid transfer, there are so many things to think about when it comes to mitochondria. It's not even, you can't even just say no. mitochondrial dysfunction. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And one thing that we, you know, as somebody who was trained in human genetics, I'm well aware that there's, right, there's lots of pediatric syndromes that are mitochondrial in origin. And when we first found that the 3 9 deletion had a mitochondrial, we were like, well, does it look like a typical mitochondrial disorder? And the answer is there is no mitochondrial, typical mitochondrial disorder, right? The symptom profile can be anything from like, you know, you have normal IQ and you just lose a little weight or you can't keep weight on to like you have seizures and, you know, you don't make it past the age of three. So, so that's another point that I think is really important is the idea that mitochondria are really complex and what you break in the mitochondria can have really different sort of phenotypic consequences. So I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. And I think we need for each of these, we need several different types of biomarkers to kind of put it into, okay, you're in this bucket of, you know, patients who have schizophrenia, who have these types of mitochondrial deficits, and then maybe we can uh, follow up with a specific kind of treatment. And with That's that, I'll ask I just want to, again, I just want to say one thing about that, just to follow on is that um, I think a lot about cancer, right? And that's what cancer does okay, right now, right? A woman has a bre has breast cancer. We genotype her tumor and based on what her, the markers that her tumor is showing, we know what chemotherapy agent is going to be most effective. And I wonder if in a few years, if for neurodegeneration, for schizophrenia, for other things, we're going to, you know, do a similar thing. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. That's the hope. I think we're always following cancer and in some ways, <laughs> in some ways you know, brain is the most difficult because we don't really have access to, you know, we don't have access to the tissue uh, exactly. so much. I mean, in these cases, it, it, you can, you can do genetic testing for sure, but yeah, it's a little bit less accessible and it's a little bit less aggressive. I think that's, uh, you know, something that makes it more difficult to target exactly. because if you have cancer, you're sort of 
throw whatever you can at it. So if you can't do that with schizophrenia. The person's going to live for a long time after that. So you want to make sure it's safe and all of that. But yes, hopefully we'll catch up to the cancer field on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a, a specific question on the translation. Do you think my, mitochondrial boosting interventions such as mitophagy, NAT plus or other might trigger rewiring in the cerebellum or otherwise? I hope so. <laughs> I mean, that's something that we'd love to try, right? If we really... Um, one of the things we think about is um, when you put a mice or people on a ketogenic diet, um, it tends to boost mitochondrial function and mitochondria proliferate. And we wonder, um, we want to try that and ask, you know, what happens. So Yeah, that would be very interesting. And if you ever do want to try um, mytophagy enhancement, let us know. We're <laughs> obviously schizophrenia is not our area, but we're happy to, you know, share them. But who all. knows, right? Let's speak yes. to the mice and see what happens. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, well, I think that was the last question that we had um, come in. Uh, so we thank you so much for your, your presentation. This was really, really interesting and super interesting to see uh, mitochondrial dysfunction in different you know, neuro indications. So yeah, please keep in touch. We'll definitely keep up to date on your research. And um, and if you have any questions on it, you know, if, if you'd like any of the molecules we have, we're happy to share as well. That would be amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was lovely and amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Bye.